first time I, I attended a, a sudden death it was a motorcycle gang member um, drove straight into a palm tree. That was, as a 20 year old, picking up someone and it felt like, um, I described it as a, you know, a bag full of broken pottery. I've seen it firsthand. Um, my relatives, you know, were, were in gangs and also my 10 years in the police obviously I'm, I'm interacting with, with the gangs all the time. Sean, how are you, mate? Yeah, good, mate. Good, how are you? Yes, I'm fantastic. Um, this opportunity. <laughs> my life's certainly better since reading your book, which I recommend everybody reads. Um, oh, thanks. thanks. Yeah, thanks. I mean, even if you're not somebody that's prone to panic or whatever, which you're, I kind of wasn't like at that stage, but this just really helps ground your understanding of the body's flight, uh, fight and flight mechanism, which affects us, all of us on a daily basis, several times a day. And yet until I read this, I'd never really focused on it, Sean. But before we talk about your great book, Attack Panic, um, how are things in New Zealand? Oh, I think everyone's pretty, um, pretty keen to, you know, to close off two, 2020. Yeah, let's hit, hit the, let's reset, not, hit the reset let's, button. <laughs> yeah, let's not even mention the um, the C and the number because oh, that, yeah. that gets yeah. us screwed up with YouTube. They don't even like me talking about it, right? Yeah, yeah. No, that, that's that, that's that's about all I was going to say. So we're we're really um we're we're keen to see the end of this year and um sort of reset the buttons but um you know we're we're pretty well divorced from what's going on around the world and you know we live in our own little bubble yeah <laughs> you know what i mean so we're everything's pretty cool here eh? you know where our economy's still still moving along with um uh we're just moving to the summer so the, the weather's improving and um spirits are high but um it's pretty tough, just like everywhere else. But um, New Zealand, New Zealand seems to be quite resilient. Yes, but I had an absolutely fantastic time traveling around New Zealand in my friend's camper van. And uh, my only criticism is, you need a better rugby team. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> definitely at the moment. Oh, you know, like my my old grandma used to say, you know, boy, a good old hiding never hurt anyone. <laughs> <laughs> so, a good old a good old thrashing now and then is good for is good. Yes, for it get it's a, it's the I, I almost said the great reset then, which is a bloody Orwellian newspeak word, but yes. So, you're in the police force for several years. Yeah, I did. Uh, I did my ten years. I wanted to do, wanted to do ten years. Um, so I had a I had a, a yeah really fruitful and rewarding career. Uh, most of that was spent in the CIB as a detective. Um, and yeah, it was it was great. It was traumatic. It was stressful. Didn't realize it at the time what was going on. But you know the way we dealt with trauma back in those days was just go out and drink lots and misbehave and you know, and comfort by numbers, security and numbers. Um, yes. Can you give us some examples, Sean, of the traumatic things that you exper experienced? I mean, are we, are we talking like shootings and stabbings and stuff? And Yeah, so <clears throat> in, in terms of my own personal safety, nothing, nothing like that. Although, you know, I was in fights and there was lots of, you know, attacks with, um, you know, with weapons and things like that. But when I say traumatic, I'm, I'm talking about the experiences that I had to attend, you know, anything from, you know, murders and, and rapes and child, child molestation and all that sort of carry on and 
right through to you know car accidents and attending deaths and, and things like that so i wrote in my book about you know the very first time i i attended a, a sudden death it was a motorcycle gang a motorcycle gang member um drove straight into a palm tree and um back in those days they wore you know those sort of german style army helmets they were completely useless at protecting your head and they didn't even um, tie them down so you know as he collided and you know impacted against a tree nothing protected his head so i was a 20 20 year old 20 year old policeman then and i'd only been in the police about you know several weeks and i attended because i was a motor i, I ride rode motorcycles back then as well so that was one of my that was my first um sudden death that i attended all by myself and i had to deal with it all by myself and that was as a 20 year old picking up someone's head and it felt like um i described it as a you know a bag full of broken pottery when you when you try to you know handle with as much compassion as you could the body and it was just like a a sack of broken pottery and um you know that was my first sort of uh exposure to, to death and you know over the years you you attended lots and lots of um you know sudden death and um, car cra you know, deaths through car crashes and all sorts of other hangings and you know murders and you know bodies that have been in lakes for bloody weeks and been discovered and stuff like that so that's that's the trauma i'm talking about um, and then there's that the the other side side of trauma is when you're just dealing with um, just really bad people, you know, doing really bad things to other people, like f children, for example, you know, um, children's sex offending and rapes and um, real violent offending as well. Mm. So yeah, um, that's the sort of trauma that I'm talking about that. Um, you you deal with or you think you're dealing with and you probably are dealing with it on the outside because normally the good thing about being in the police is when you're dealing with um scenarios or you know um serious crimes or uh, anything those sorts of situations you're usually with a group you're with numbers and there's comfort in numbers so you know you all sort of deal with the situation and then you go and sort of debrief and then you go out back in my day you get on the piss yeah. and um you know and just to deal with it deal with it in numbers like that and you know um my my belief is that uh, anxiety conditions are a learned behavior but i also do believe that there's probably some predisposition as well you know some people may be a bit more prone to you know being exposed to or um, succumbing to anxious anxiety or mm. or whatever for whatever reason do you think and, Sean there's an sorry there's an analogy like you know your upbringing and your personality and your disposition like loads the gun right puts the bullet in the gun and cocks it but it's your it's your um it's your nurture it's your environment it's your conditioning and and and, and your learned behavior that put pull, that that pulls the trigger so just because you might have a disposition to being a bit more, you know, a bit more anxious or a bit more shy or whatever, because of your upbringing or whatever, it doesn't mean you have to put up with that shit. Yeah. It doesn't mean you have to let it rule your life and let it limit you and restrict you to do whatever you want in life. Before we, we move on, Sean, I think our friends at home would find it fascinating if we could, um, talk a bit about maori culture in new zealand and sorry to, to sort of step back but you mentioned the chap on the motorbike and i've seen just through well through the media is it the Mong mongrel mob is a big a big gang down your way it's one of them we've got several um ethnic if you like uh gangs we've got the mongrel mob are fairly big we've got the black power they're fairly big and there's another couple of other shoots as well that i'm not even going to um dignify by mentioning but those are the those are the two main ones yeah yeah and that's where a lot of uh you know our, our youth um are, are going uh 
for identity and self-worth and sort of belonging and shit like that yes i my first sort of introduction to that part of life in new zealand was the film once were warriors mm -hmm. which was a huge hit over here anybody that grew up my, you know my generation or or certainly watch videos i think it was in the 80s it's, so yep. you got in, introduced to this uh, indigenous people in new zealand and they all seemed a bloody big very tattooed and a bit psycho of course having been there i now understand the the socio-economic implications of 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 how new zealand has developed since since it was colonized um sorry if that's not the right word but but since that's all good you know since the the, the northerners went went down there <laughs> um but that film was like really hard hard hitting is does, does that still play out in parts is is that kind of what the mongrel mob type of culture cut comes yeah. from yeah, and I, I can vouch for that because, you know, I'm, I'm Ngāti Kahanunu um, and I was brought up in Hawke's Bay in Marae Nui, um, which is the sort of lower socio socioeconomic area of uh, Napier, the Hawke's Bay. So I've seen it firsthand. Um, my relatives, you know, were, were in gangs and also my 10 years in the police. Obviously, I'm, I'm interacting with, with the gangs all the time. So it's definitely a thing it's pretty accurate um but i just need to stress that that's the minority you know that's um most people growing up will never be exposed to that environment you know it's um it's not an environment that you see everywhere you go um you'd, you'd only have you'd have to go to a particular part of town to particular we call them public bars they're called public bars here um where that you know with that sort of uh, profile um, you know um member of society or sector of society go so it's definitely a minority um but they can be rat bags and they can cause a bit of problems they normally only cause problems within themselves you know they keep they keep to themselves mm. but uh now, now and then it um, spills over to the to the general public but what otherwise they keep to themselves what is it that makes some indigenous maori have the the tattoos and i'm obviously thinking the facial tattoos in particular and and, and some people choose choose not to i i think it's an obvious question obvious answer but i'm, I'm not yeah, going to well, get the I, chance I, to ask somebody this. yeah yeah well i mean i'm i don't know if i'm you know, this is probably outside my swim lane to be fair but from my own experience um you know that's uh, that's a sense of identity and it's a sense of belonging it gives them a sense of um like i said identity and and part of part of a, a fano part of a part of a gang mm -hmm. um so it gives them that self it gives them that self worth why some do and some don't um i don't i don't really know but it, it definitely is part of the culture um, yeah. like respect for ancestors as well i would would imagine well you know that there, there is that that type of um of you know um tattoo or, or moko but uh, the, the the ones with the swastikas and you know ckl and all that the other the other part of the side of the the tattooing that's that's more about belonging to a gang or family that's their new family and they're just, you know, identifying themselves and creating and advertising the family, that, the whānau that they now belong to. And it seems like a good idea at the time, but, um, you know, it usually bites them in the bum when they grow up because a lot of them grow up and, you know, come to their senses. And Yeah, of course. Uh, and, and crystal meth was something I fell foul of in Hong Kong, as anyone who's read my memoir will know. Um, I believe that's called P in New Zealand, is it? Yep. yep. Methamphetamine. And these, I'm guessing these gangs are dealing 
dealing this sort of stuff in large quantities to, to fund their activities? Yeah, uh, so that's, uh, you know, that's the intelligence. That's what we're being led to believe. Um, um, and I think there's probably a bit of truth to that in my experience as a police policeman, you know, um, that sort of, uh, you know, drug dealing and manufacture and sale, um, always, there's always a drug, uh, a gang element there, definitely. Yes. And it's interesting because New Zealand, I mean, it is that country that's always quoted as being so far away from the rest of the world, which is wonderful for uh, for you guys. And it's great for us backpackers that have been down there because, um, yeah, it's just an, an amazing place. And yeah. we could have a whole podcast just talking about the diversity in New Zealand, the exciting things to do all the adventure sports i did my first first part of my skydiving course down at taupo the trout fishing is amazing it's got to be the best in the world the, the rainbow trout are huge yeah. um so yeah uh, the the volcanic springs the the, the sulfuric fumes coming up from the drain covers from from the volcanic activity um the 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 landscape is i mean lord of the rings obviously was filmed there and anyone who's seen that that movie will will <laughs> would in, would get something from just visiting new zealand alone um yeah, for sure. but just just to finish off because i don't want to detract too much from your story sean i'm just really fascinated about such things um, gra grass, as in weed, is obviously grown in the local area. I'm yep. guessing that the the pea or the meth is either made in New Zealand or shipped from from Asia or Australia. Um, yeah, that's a good question. I, I think that we probably manufacture most most of it, in my, in my opinion. Or we've, you know, back in even back in my day, we, you know, we'd bust we've busted. You know, we'd, we'd bust quite a few labs. They're going up all over the place. They're becoming more portable even back then. Yeah. And, you know, even now anecdotally, we see on the news, um, lots of P labs are still getting, um, you know, busted um, and closed down. And, you know, lots and lots of expensive uh, assets usually, you, you usually follow suit and the proceeds of crime proceedings. So whether we're importing or not, I'm not too sure. It's, um, so this... It, it's readily available, I know that much. Yeah, so this mongrel mob, Sean, they sound like full-on soldiers at the best of times. And you put you put them on crystal meth, There's, that's going to cause some... And these guys are huge as well, aren't they, some of them? The, the, yeah. I mean, I'm guessing... Yeah, big this boys. Was, yeah. I mean, they're probably big... From an indigenous genetic perspective but i'm guessing there's some steroids and stuff going on there as well and then you chuck chuck a drug like crystal meth in the mix you must yeah. have ar armed robberies going off and real yeah you know when you put it like when you put it like that you'd expect more shit happening eh? yeah so there's not you know like i say they um they play in their own backyard. And okay, they, stick so. to them, they stick to themselves, but that's probably because of the organised nature of their crim their crime. Now, you know, I mean, again, I'm outside my swim lane, and I'm this is just my opinion. But when it's that organised, um, you don't need to go out and rob. When when you've got um, you know sophisticated distribution chains that they have. And um, I know that because, you know, my circles, I see, I see those drugs all the time. Um, you know, my social circles, I'm a musician, I'm out there playing all the time. So the, the, the distribution chains are, are very sophisticated. And so when you're making that much money, even along that distribution chain, the need to go out there into the general public and cause havoc is, is, is you know, it, <clears throat> is not needed. There's a bit of raru raru or a bit of, um, you know, um, 
trouble brew brewing between the gangs. But you know, that's gonna be around. What's the um, time. what what's their initiation? I bet it's something really extreme. I, I don't know what the initi initiation is now, Chris, but um it, it used to be it used to be pretty extreme. It used to always involve some level of violence, um, but not normally on members of the public. It was normally on ga other gang members, if you know what I mean. Yeah, some sort um, of retaliation or something, maybe. Revenge. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, and doing horrible things to each other and, you know, and um, having the, you know, the, the standard one was, you know, getting the crap absolutely beaten beaten out of you um, as part of your initiation um, and, ah. you know, committing, and committing crime committing some sort of crime was used used to be the go i honestly it's um it's been so long now since yeah i was part of that i wouldn't know what the initiation is these days and sean just one fi final question um seeing as though we've got your your knowledge well, during your time as a, as a detective, did you see much cocaine coming into New Zealand? Because no. it, it, again, it's so far away from everywhere. Yeah, um, it comes in. It definitely comes in. It's, it's, we know that it comes in because we're stopping it at the borders. So what we know is what we stop is not, uh, you know, if that's how much is coming in, we know that we're stopping that much. Yeah. You know, we're not stopping everything that comes in. So that's that's coming in. The the myth is the myth is is coming in a little. We're not we're not catching a lot of that by all by all accounts. Mm. And and I can say that because I have somebody that I communicate with regularly in, in at customs, so I know what's going on at customs. It just so happens it's just a coincidence. Um, do we? So we we it's readily available. I know that it's really available because I'm a social person. I, you know, I go out and I, I, I still like to party mm. with, with my group of friends and they're social, they're social users. So it's really available when we don't manufacture it, produce it here. We know that much. Yeah. So somehow it's still getting through. Um, the price, price is still the same <laughs> even this year with, you know, the, the borders situation and that. So, it's a really good question. Um, mm. I can't see us producing it here. No. Um, I'm just kind of curious because in the UK, it's it's fairly huge. I'm not sure if what you actually buy for your 50 quid, which is quite expensive when you consider, you know, you can get meth or something for a tenner. Um, I'm, and anyone listening, I'm not suggesting you do this. This is just uh, educational speak here. Um, but whatever you buy here, it's pretty shit. You know, it's they, they put so much other cheaper chemicals in to, to give you this false sort of sense. And if it's that bad here, and yet we're not even that diluted far, here. Yeah, then, then I'm wondering what it's like. In fact, you're probably, I'm just looking at on my map here for, for the South America. I'm, I'm not sure geographically, you're probably a bit further away, aren't you, than us? You're probably the other side of definitely. Antarctica. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. We're closer to Asia than we are to South America and you guys. Yes. And that's another weird thing is when I was in Hong Kong, which is a fair way away from um, South America. The cocaine there was just pure, <laughs> just yeah. like it's just come from the from a jungle bloody laboratory or something. Um, but then again, Hong Kong's the shipping capital of the world, probably. So all the you know the trade capital of the world. So back to your police days, then, Sean. You you started coming under severe pressure, stress, and it all started building up. Yeah, well, I just, I didn't know it. I didn't know because I never experienced inappropriate anxiety, anxiety attacks or panic attacks ever before. And I wasn't prone to 
you know shy don't think so or anything i was just you know just a normal just a normal kid growing up you know into sports into himself thought he was 10 foot tall and bulletproof and um yeah something just uh, <clears throat> something really interesting happened one day and you can't chastise yourself over trying to figure out why shit happens and you know the, the cause of it that's not important the important thing is to realize that you have a bad behavior and get rid of it you know and change the behavior um, and that removes removes the anxiety mm. but uh, do you want me to explain talk about my first time my first time i experienced a panic attack or yes please feel, feel free sean to enlighten us to whatever you you feels pertinent to your story yeah so i, I mean everything when i think back everything seemed pretty normal you know i was uh, i was a uniform policeman at that stage I was probably about 22 or 23 and then um i had to go and talk at a a school of you know primary school of, you know five and five and six year olds and i'd done that um you know a dozen times before and um i sat i sat in front of them in the room and um i just rem i just remember my heart starting to race and um you know find it, found it difficult to, to speak my my throat was you know was, was tensing up my 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 stomach uh, butterflies were you know started um bloody um i experienced butterflies in my stomach and everything was tightening up and i just felt this oh overwhelming urge to get the fuck out of there you know like it was just really really overwhelming and i couldn't think and and um you know what was happening i was having i was having this you know i was having a panic attack but i didn't know what was happening i don't know why but um and i, I just couldn't function and you know i was profusely sweating and, and everything and um yeah i just just was i had an outer it was like an outer body or derealization or depersonalization experience and what was what was happening was my um subconscious mind and my um my, the panic button had been turned on for whatever reason, for whatever reason, um, the panic button was turned on in a situation when it shouldn't have ever been turned on. But I reacted badly and it made, I made a situation worse. But I couldn't go anywhere, so I just sat there and I just sucked it up. Um, and I, I gave my talk and it was, I was embarrassed, you know, then you, you overcome, you're overcome with embarrassment and all this sort of carry on because you just don't know what's happening. And that was the very first time. But what happened was I, I didn't get up or go or go anywhere because I couldn't, I had to keep talking. So within about five minutes, um, it had gone. That fear had gone and the sensations, the sensations had um, subsided. The adrenaline was still present in my body as I didn't know this. The reason why the the anxiety condition uh, sensations increase was because adrenaline's released into the body to prepare you for fight or flight. That's what's happening. That's why you're feeling on edge, and every every all hell breaks loose. So there was still adrenaline in my body, but because I'm an adrenaline junkie, it felt good, and um, that's probably part of my problems is because I always sought adrenaline adrenaline inducing activities. Um. But when you've got that adrenaline in your body and you don't know why it's there, it can be quite uncomfortable. Um, but anyway, I stayed there, I did the talk, and within five minutes, it had all gone, gone away. And I was going, wow, that was fucking weird. So I left, I jumped in the patrol car wondering what the hell just happened, and then just forgot about it and just didn't think much of it. But what happened was over time, that those sorts of incidences will keep happening randomly more and more and then what happens is you start worrying about that that memory the experience and you start you start thinking about and anticipating the next time things like that happens and so over time what's happening in the background is your normal level of anxiety through behavior modification through rep repetitiveness your baseline level of anxiety is growing in the background it's you know it's levels are, are rising and rising and your new normal anxiety levels are, are, are getting higher and higher um whereas you know when you're born you have say you just have a this is your baseline 
level of anxiety and through through you know trauma through stress through exhaustion through whatever you can start stressing out and you can get exhausted and it happens with everybody and if you don't take time to relax and to chill out and to allow the anxiety to recede back down to normal you'll end up um, resetting your anxiety levels if that makes sense that's the layman's terms of what's going on so next minute you're walking around and you're functioning with all this adrenaline in your body because your anxiety levels your baseline anxiety levels being reset to higher than normal levels so you're firing off all these bloody anxious sensations all the time and if you don't know what's happening you start becoming aware of that you start becoming concerned about it and what we call resistance you start resisting it so the more you resist the more the persist the more um, and you resist the, the more prevalent these sensations get and you're just building this anxious behavior so you're walking around anticipating these shots of adrenaline and panic and sure enough that's going to happen because that's where your you know your attitude and and and, and your uh, attention is and so you for me I would I'd be walking around and you're just having panic attacks all over the place and I couldn't even I didn't even know what was causing it so I couldn't go okay there's a cafe I'm not going to go into that cafe because I'm going to have a panic attack um, so the just panic attacks the, time. the panic attacks are kicking in and what we're saying here Sean is your response in trying to protect yourself from them is actually entrenching them deeper and setting your your oh, turn, that, turn that light down sorry is is it's actually establishing them even more yeah 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 that's right your your behavior is perpetuating the problem your conscious your conscious attitude is making the situation worse wow and yeah in, in, in a nutshell i mean we're just brushing over brushing over this but essentially your conscious attitude in the moment is what fuels um anxiety to, to into panic attacks anxiety anxiety attacks start with a little sensation and that sensation is um, brings up a memory and experience so the, the trigger, like, for example, if you're going to a, a queue in a bank, if you stand in the line, and this is a thing, and if that triggers, triggers an, an, a response, an anxious response, that's not the problem. That's not the problem at all. The, the problem is what you do with that anxious, um, initial anxious sensation, if that makes sense. So if I'm going into a boardroom, so this is one of my ones. So I'll, I'll use my experiences. At the height of my at the height of my panic, <clears throat> I'd be sitting in the in the boardroom, and it's fucking ridiculous now when I think about it. And the minute someone looked at me or asked me a question, um, I'd feel these really uncomfortable tightening, this tightening in my chest and my stomach, and just start becoming really. Um, have these out of body experiences and and those initial sensations would turn up and what i did with that at that point determined whether it just fizzled out into nothing or whether fucking just you know went haywire and all hell broke loose and um, turned on the panic button and resulting in the overwhelming urge to just get the hell out of there um and so it was, it was that initial sensation of people looking at me and going, oh, fuck, I'm going to embarrass myself. I've got, to, I've got to get out of here. I've got to get out of here. Now, if I kept thinking like that, which is what happens, you will, it will get so bad where you have to leave. You don't have to actually leave, but that's what you believe. So until, until you act on that belief, more adrenaline is going to be pumped into your body. You're going to get more on feel more on edge and all your senses are going to get heightened to the point where you just got to either fight or run but it doesn't have to be like that you can disempower it as soon as that initial sensation or trigger turns up you walk ptsd you walk in soldiers or ex-police 
you walk into a cafe and you're, you're the people that you're with say we're going to sit in the middle of the, the cafe fuck that will just trigger all sorts of like fuck that's going to happen you know i'm going to the exit i'm sitting up against the wall so that's creating all these this tension and if you act if you act on that if you go um if you go towards that middle of that of that cafe it's going to create even more tension and anxiety it's just it's going to release even more adrenaline into your body and you'll probably freak out and act on that and what i'm saying is you don't have to act on that you can talk to yourself in a way that turns the panic button off yes i'm i'm resonating with this because when I'm talking to an audience, sometimes I'm thinking like, sorry, go and just move this light, Sean. It's, it's never in the right place. Um, yeah, I'm talking to an audience and as the speaker's introducing me in the seconds, it's like five, four. I'm stood there thinking, oh my God. What, you know, you get that kind of nervous feeling and you think, what if I can't speak? What if I'm like, uh, 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 <laughs> right? But what what I do, I don't know if this is if this is some of you. Is I'm just like, oh fuck it, I'm in for a penny, in for a pound. Just dive in and just just this is. If it was easy, everyone would would be doing it, you know, and and suddenly that switch just enables me to sort of go into professional professional mode 100 percent, and that's that's a huge takeaway if there are sufferers um watching or listening <clears throat> and they think they have to cope what you, what they need to know is that every time you um you act on that false fear so well, let's call it a false alarm right Let's call this public speaking five, four, three, two, one. It's your turn. That trigger or that fear, which is perfectly normal, um, if you were to act on that, so what, 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 what's happening is your false alarm is telling you to do something. And I'll go back to my situation in the boardroom. The false alarm is saying, "Fuck, Sean, you better get the hell out of here before you embarrass the shit out of yourself." You know, if before you have to start talking, find an excuse find an excuse to just go you've got to go right now so if you act on that and you get up and you follow on that belief if you if you if you um yeah if you act on that you're going to go out of the room and you're going your your panic will immediately subside because there's no more fear by doing that you've told your subconscious that there's no more fear but every time you do that you reinforce the fact, shit, that was lucky I left that boardroom because if I had stayed there, it would have been really embarrassing. But the, one of the takeaways for sufferers, and it might be really hard to understand or believe or even you know have trust in what I'm saying is, if you did stay there, nothing would ever happen. The fact that you went against what your false alarm was telling you to do, is a non-resistant attitude and the fact that you stay there because it's bullshit, because it's a false alarm, nothing will ever happen. And when you stay there and when you stand up and just go, fuck it, that what you just said, fuck it. You know, my mantra is, uh, it is what it is. Fuck it, it is what it is. I'm going to get up, I'm going to move forward and I'm going to engage. The minute you open your mouth, everything's fine. Yes. It, it, it always is because you're dealing with a false alarm that you're not acting on. The two things you need to know before you go into your hot moments, the, the, the most important thing that the ther therapies don't, don't tell you or, or the programs don't tell you is you've got to do some homework before you go and um, address your anxiety provoking situations. You have to know intimately what you believe is going to happen, right? You, you need to know what the false alarm is telling you to do. The, in the boardroom situation, for me, the false alarm would be, fuck, get the hell out of here before you embarrass the shit out of yourself. Yep, before they look at you and you have to speak. 
find a reason to get out. That's what the, my belief, my, my false alarm is telling me to run. Run before you embarrass yourself. You've got to know before you go into your hot moments what your beliefs are because you need to be able to challenge them in the right way. You've got to know what your false alarm wants you to do because your job is to not do what that false alarm is telling you to do. That's all you need to do. And you need to know what you do physiologically as well. Okay. In your hot moment, you're going to do things. For example, if, um, if I'm at a, in a boardroom and the people are looking at me and it's my turn and someone mentions me, you know, you get this sort of thing going on here. You're trying to freaking shrink and you sort of, you know, and people are looking at you. So, you know, it's like, you need to know all these physiological things you do to protect yourself because while if while you're doing those, you have reinforced to the subconscious mind that you need protecting. So you know, I know what my false alarm is telling me to do, to get the fuck out. Well, I'm not going to do it. I know physiologically what I normally do. So, you know, when I came out of it, when I fucking kicked its ass, is when I felt the sensations turning up, I fucking move forward. I, I, my, I use my physio physiology positively. Instead of going like this and trying to shrink, I, you know, I... I push my shoulders back, I pump my chest out, I move forward and I put my hands on the table right in fucking front of anyone and I just spoke. And as soon as I did that, nothing happened. So the showing people how to disempower panic is really easy. It's really easy and it can, it's 100% um, you know, successful every single time you do what I've just said providing you've done your homework the problem the problem here chris is that you have the success and you run out of the room and you go and tell your wife that you've just healed yourself and go and tell your friends and you know you've got this new lease of life because you're no longer limited by all this shit but what you don't realize is that you still have a bad habit right so the next time you go into a queue at a bank the next time you go to public speak or the next time you go to a situation that triggers your panic it's going to happen again <clears throat> and again and again and again until you rewrite until you change the record until you change the habitual patterns of behavior and that's the problem for people because they think wow i've just healed myself and then tomorrow they go back into a cafe and the shit happens again they forget what to do in a hot moment they forget what to do in a hot moment because it's still a habitual pattern of behavior to react the way they reacted. So they're going up like this and they go, have a success. And then they have a failure and they go, oh, fuck, this shit doesn't work. And they just go back coping and managing and you know, using all their safety crutches and excuses. But if they just realize that it's one thing to disempower panic in the moment, it's, that's a piece of piss. But to remove the triggers, to remove the sense, uh, the sensitivity, to remove the, the panic, you have to do some work. You've got to do some work on yourself. You've got to build some new routines. You've got to reset that amygdala from this base, new baseline back down to normal. And you can only do that through repetitive behavior. You know, you created, you created the habitual pattern of behavior through repetitive anxious behavior, whether you knew it or not. The only way to reset that is by practicing being a non-anxious person, day in, day out, routine after routine after routine. And that's what sufferers won't, won't do. So they yes. have success, they have success, but then they expect it, like they expect to be healed instantly when that's not how habituation, it's not how behavior works. You don't pick up a guitar, I'm a musician, you don't pick up a guitar and a week after trying to learn how to play like Stevie Ray Vaughan, you chuck it away and go, oh, this shit doesn't work, I can't play like Stevie Ray Vaughan. You don't expect that. Well, ch changing your patterns of habitual patterns of behavior is exactly the same, but we, we because it's uncomfortable and it's based around discomfort and fear, we want that shit gone now we're not willing 
to expose ourselves over time to keep practicing an attitude and practicing and practicing and practicing until it becomes second nature that's my takeaway yeah the the points that are coming up here for me is also if you went to see a traditional let's say therapist or what they call talk therapy two things are going to happen there one I doubt that therapist is going to be saying the direct action measures that you're telling me now, Sean, right? Hmm. I reckon they're going to be more. I know I'm, I haven't done it. So I, I'm not generalizing here. I'm I'm, This is for the sake of conversation, but if they're like, Oh, they're there, you're okay. You know, you tell me what happened. Well, two things. One, they're not getting this vital tool that clearly is the thing to address the panic right it's the Mm -hmm. turn around face it um i know there's a i know there's a lot more to it because i've read you a lot more things you can do because i've read your book but also along with not getting the the proper tool to deal with it you're re-establishing that fear and panic by talking through these scenarios all the time so, Absolutely, 100 percent. There's got to be a balance about talking about it because when you talk about something that doesn't even exist, that's that is a ghost, that's a false alarm. Every time you talk to the wrong person about it, you're reinforcing that behavior, right? And that's why I say in my book, don't talk to family members about it. Talk to someone like myself or a therapist that knows their shit, right? Because too much talking just reinforces this false fear. Um, I'm not, we're not, in, you know, there's a, there's, a, there's a balance between allowing you, say if you're a sufferer, I'd let you, because I've got to build that relationship with you. So I'm going to listen to you for a little bit, but I'm a coach. I'm not a therapist and a coach student relationship. The coach does all the talking. The student just listens and does what he's, he or she's told, right? but you've got to build that relationship up. So I'll listen to your story a little bit, but I want to get to the cause. I, I want to get to giving you the tools and, and, the, and the education and the training and um, the roadmap and the program to heal yourself if you want to heal yourself. There's way too much, way too much talk um, going on. There should be more coaching. Um, you know, student... In any student coach scenario, the student fucking doesn't do all the talking. The coach does all the talking. Whether you're an individual tennis tennis coach, tennis student, or whether you're a team, you don't hear the, the bloody team talking all the time. It's got to be, they've got to shift that balance. But you can't do that without building that relationship. And that's the that's the big, that's the big rub. Unless the therapist or the whatever, the counselor, whatever can re- relate to you it's a, it's a bit of an uphill battle getting students to do what they have to do and even myself man i i re- you know i can build really strong relationships and there are just some that are just so entrenched in this fear that they're just not willing to do what they have to do they can you know they can disempower panic but to day in day out do what you need to do the mantras you know you have the, the, the self-talk, the self-love, the self-acceptance, the gratitude and the practicing going into your hot moments with the right attitude, with the right mantra set up, with your right setup and all your planning, you know, it takes, it fucking takes effort, man, because it's really uncomfortable. It's um, got to but, become a part of you, Sean, right? It's, I mean, there's two things we haven't spoken about, but there's two things I do in my everyday life, every single second of the day. I probably even do it when I'm asleep now. One is ultimate self-love. And you can add in that forgiveness because I've done shit loads of stupid stuff in my life, right? Of which I'm completely still apologetic. Cring- still cringing, still cringing over. Oh, it. God, still, yeah. Still cringe material. <laughs> chuck, chuck in a... Yeah, good sprinkling or a few shovelfuls of cringe as well. So ultimate self-love, which involves forgiveness. Um, 
just as an aside, I chuck it in there for people that are interested. But for me, the past is the past. I don't, I don't even think. The only thing I think about the past is the good stuff. The rest of it, I couldn't care less about. Today's today. Tomorrow is my future. Just on that forgiveness, Chris. Just one thing with the for forgiveness. It's really important that we forgive ourselves because we, we've got to be able to forgive others as well. Because you know we're not. To be able to forgive yourself and to be able to forgive others is to acknowledge that I'm not perfect yeah. and neither is anyone else. So that compassion, you do that for yourself. You forgive others for yourself. It's a real healing. Yes. Um, when, I'm, when I'm chatting to my young people, Sean, doing, doing the odd bit of life coaching, I, I explain it like this. If you're in a marble championship of the world, you've got your big pot of marbles but in life the reality is you've got a gripe with this person because i don't know they bullied you at school or they backhanded you when you didn't you know didn't deserve it or not not that we deserve getting hit but something like this it's like you're trying to win the marble championship of the world but you're taking your marbles and you're putting them in their pot and then you wonder why you're not winning i.e why you're not happy and it's it's what sean said you you have to forgive i mean For, yeah it doesn't yeah. mean like accepting that bad behavior is okay that's a different thing again it's that you gotta understand this person's human they got a story like you if they were bullying you at school imagine the shit that they were probably going through at home this that, kind of that's, thing, that right? that's that that's that empathy and compassion brother you know, to forgive others is to acknowledge, acknowledge that, you know, you're not perfect as well. And it's a real moral high ground that so it's always a slippery slope, that moral high ground that refuses to um, forgive people for their, for their actions. That's a real high moral ground that um, that's a long way to fall because you're just, you're effectively, in my opinion, you're effectively saying, well, my shit doesn't stink when it does. It stinks just as much as anyone else's. Yeah. And it, that forgiveness of others is awful for me. I forgive others for me, not necessarily for the other person. It feels good. Anything that bloody feels good, you should do. You know, that, that doesn't harm anyone else. That's good for people around you. You should just do it. Um, yeah. yeah. But it's a big leveler with respect to the panic. It's a good reminder this self-love, self-forgiveness, that we're all equal, that when you're in that boardroom and the pack, there's no one in there that's better than you. There's no one in there that probably is even judging you. Um, so, it's sorry, all... Chris. Yeah, yeah you, sorry, you go. Yeah. No, no, no. I, I... Here's another good, good takeaway that sufferers, any, any sufferers listening to this needs to know that in all my years of suffering, even my friends had no idea I was suffering. I was panicking at the time. And in all my years of, of study and research under trainers and my last 11 years of helping other people, right? nobody really knows when people are having difficulty because for, for many reasons. One reason is because we're all just too wrapped up in our, in our own stuff. So people... People don't even realize when people are under, you know, uh, are having difficulty in their boardroom. No one knows. No one knew that I was having difficulty. And I know that because I went back and I spoke with, you know, colleagues. I had, they said we had no fucking idea that was going on. You look normal. You look almost cocky. You know, and that was part of a, a byproduct. But that's for, for people that are... Um, that, that suffer from social social um, anxiety or social phobia, it's the fear of the sensations, but it's also the fear of being embarrassed. That That's just another level of um, difficulty, having this fear of being embarrassed. But the takeaway is you're not as important as you think you are. <laughs> you're not as important as you think you are. And no one really knows because we're all just tied up in our own thing and we all act differently anyway. And so how to deal with this fear of being embarrassed is through self-love, building up self-love and gratitude and acceptance for yourself. 
and being prepared to be embarrassed. Being okay with not being okay, being prepared to get out there. And if the if it turns to shit, I'm going to start practicing like I'm not giving a fuck. And you start doing that and you start turning the tables. But ultimately, no, people don't, people don't really know what's going on. I think we, we think we're too important. Yeah, is, uh, well, the problem. this is part of, I don't want to sort of talk, go on to a parallel um, narrative here, but I've got my ideas of why we're, why so many people are screwed up in society. I don't think it's accidental. I think if it's all part of an agenda by the the ruling elite sociopaths that that have controlled the whole goddamn show since the days of Babylon, right? Um, control the money system, control the mainstream media, control everything. I think one of the things they're good at doing is getting you to focus on your identity as an individual, as opposed to understanding that we're, we are, whether we like it or not, part of something much bigger. And this is where it gets clever. So these carbon molecules that people like to call Chris Thrall, but which in actual fact, they're just, I'm just carbon molecules held together at a vibrating frequency. I'm actually no different to a book if you really want to get you know, analytical. And as such, I can dismiss a, a lot of day-to-day -day things like panic I, I, because I am I know that this is just an illusion. I'm trying to talk here without sounding utterly confusing, but I know that I'm a part of the universe first, primarily, and that this universe has been here since time immemorial and it's going to be here to infinity. So, so is, so are these molecules. And by reminding myself that I'm part of the universe first, secondly, I just happen to be formed like this, you know, when I, if I die next week, you suddenly these molecules, they will be different stuff. This molecule will be up flying in a bird. This molecule will be running down a, down a river, the molecules in my foot might be floating in the sea. Molecules in my heart might be reforming as a, as a tree or as a carrot in someone's vegetable patch, right? It's, this is it, you are, you are this beautiful thing called the universe, which is a crazy experiment. I don't really care to even want to understand uh, or, or I kind of know I'm never gonna understand it and I'm happy with that. And when you take yourself out of yourself like that, there's a lot less stress on trying to be bloody perfect. And right on. You know, who the hell cares about it? You get one life in this form, just bloody enjoy it. And if people want to be idiots, mm -hmm. well, it's just they're not very far on their journey, are they? They've got some learning to do to, be, to become well-rounded people. You know, and an attitude like that, like seeing yourself in the bigger picture, um, actually is a, is a really good tool um, to expand your awareness in situations. It's, it is actually a really good tool to start building up your awareness exactly the way you've described it. Mm. And also, you know, in the words of the great George Carlin, you know, not giving a shit. You can take what I've just said out of context, but man, that is the best advice you can start practicing but the thing is, your attitude, my attitude of not giving a shit, it's powerful. But you've got to be prepared day in, day out, practicing that, you know. Some sufferers are really good at giving it a go for a couple of days and then allow habits to, to creep back in. Because we're creatures of habit, because habits don't like dying, they won't just roll over. They'll keep coming back. And it can be really, it can be really tough for sufferers to change their behavior and change their attitude. It's not impossible, but they've got to be prepared. And this is another takeaway. You've got to be prepared 
to practice and practice a new attitude. And it's going to be tough. It's always difficult at the start. Anything you, you try and do for a start, at the start, it's going to be difficult. You go on a diet for the first two to three weeks. It's fucking hell. Everywhere you look, there's a chicken walking past, you know, chicken wings walking past. Everything smells like food. But after three weeks, if you were just to keep, if you were to just stick to it, shit gets easier and easier. Going and training at a gym for the first two to three weeks a month, it's tough. But eventually you, you start forming the habit. Mm. And this is my takeaway. You've, you know, the advice that Chris has given in this whole expansive awareness that you're, you're part of a bigger thing rather than this little person that everyone's looking at and fucking judging, which never happens. To be able to expand your, your awareness to the universe, to be able to adopt an attitude like who gives a shit um, and develop self-love and acceptance, it takes repetition and practice and uh, yeah if sufferers are, if sufferers are willing to fucking put in the work um then they'll get the rewards we in maori we have a little saying do the mahi mahi is maori for work and it's you know do the mahi get the treats if you do the work you get the treats but it's trying to get sufferers up to the starting, you know, up to the plate to start swinging and, and persistently swing. But that's what my program does. That's what I do. Mm. Is I give them the roadmap and the program to, to do that shit. So, Sean, to, to finish off, how, how can people access your services or, or, or your, your skills? And where can they find your book? I'll just reach out to me at um, um, attackpanic.co.nz. Um, okay, I'll I'll put that link below our yeah, chat. Yeah, just yeah, just reach out and um, you know we'll have a chat. Um, I have a, a coaching program, a personal coaching program, four week coaching program. Um, I have you know obviously my book. You can buy my book through my through my website. You can go on to Amazon. You can buy it online um but yeah just reach out just reach out and let's start a conversation and um see where you go um i've got some big you know some big ideas and visions of of where i want my next book to go and my programs to go and mm. you know it's um it's nothing better than helping someone who's found themselves in a pickle i've been doing this for 10 11 years now i published eight years ago and you know since then it's just been really humbling and rewarding just helping people um get their life back and, and heal themselves you know so uh you know this is this is what i want to do for the rest of my life um, yeah so we've and, given basically we've given five practical tools sean has given five practical tools there that we can all implement if we're experiencing this panic business, you know, turn around, face it head on. Ultimate self love and forgiveness. Remember, we're part of a much bigger thing. Our time in this form is very limited. So just get on and enjoy it. Remember, probably not as important as maybe you you think you are in that moment of panic and no one's judging you and if no they are that's their issue but you know we're, we're really focusing on this the anxiety uh social anxiety social phobia part of an, the anxiety conditions a eh? but that that's really good but it, it's so important that no one no one's judging us apart from ourselves and but you need to practice being a non-judge, non-judge, self-judging person. You can't just listen to me and Chris and then the next day think that shit's going to change. Nothing's mm -hmm. going to change. You need to put in the work. You need to put in the persistent behavioral modifications or the you know the changes. Um, but you've got to know, you've got to know intimately what this false alarm's telling you to do. Because every time you cope. Every time you pull out a coping strategy, like pull out your phone or sit against a wall at a cafe or walk away from the queue or cower down when people are looking at you, cross your arms or 
try and make yourself physiologically look smaller. Every time you do all these little bits, you're just reinforcing bad behavior. You've got to know what your belief or your false alarm is telling you to do. You've got to know beforehand what you do physically to protect yourself. And then all you do is you fucking don't do it. No matter what fucking happens, don't do it. But you've got to know and understand what's happening. Hey, eh, Chris, in the background, you've got to understand the truth about what's going on before you can grab, grab the courage to do what I'm telling you to do. Yes. Without belief in what we're saying, you're, you'll run out of puff. You know, you'll be like, okay, Sean and Chris, I'm going to try this. I'm going to try this, but until it gets too hot, when shit gets too hot, I'm out of here. And, um, you know, that's, that's a recipe for disaster. So friends at home, much love to you all. Thank you so much for watching uh, another episode of the Bought the T-Shirt podcast. Um, I love having this podcast where I get to chat to wonderful people like Sean and we can come Thank up you. with this stuff. And we, as you probably guess, we're, we're not spring chickens. I'm a bit less springy than Sean, I, I, I reckon. And <laughs> we, we have learned some shit over the years. And we're kind enough or thoughtful enough or, or, or we just understand it's only right that we give these tools to you, especially our young people, because you got all this stuff to come and you don't want to be the person in that team meeting that sat there going, don't speak to me next. Don't ask my opinion. Right. Because it, it doesn't have to be like that. So thank you all for watching. If you could like and subscribe, that would be wonderful. Uh, I'll see you next time. Sean, thank you ever so much, mate. No problem, mate. Thank you. Privilege.